Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're rejoined by Blake King, a power systems engineer. Blake has extensive experience working on modeling power grids. We dig into the decentralized versus centralized mining setup debate, ERCOT, and the Bitcoin mining renewable energy conversation. Blake, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Good to see you again. Uh, Glad to be here. Last time I saw you in person was at a Compass party back in Denver, but your life has changed a little bit since then. Could you give our listeners an update on yourself and where you're at? Oh, sure. So my name is Blake King, um, power systems engineer. Uh, Met Will and a bunch of Compass folks at a Denver happy hour, I think it was. Um, Since moved to Asheville, North Carolina. I've got a wife that's you know 39 weeks and some change pregnant. So if I if I leave or something, that's probably why. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, I've worked in power my whole career, which is you know five or so years now, and I've been a Bitcoiner for pretty much just as long. So it's really really been interesting to kind of learn more about my industry and keep in keep in touch with Bitcoin and inject ideas where I can. So. Yeah, your Twitter is a, a great place for people to get to know you and also follow along. Uh, so we'll include that in the show notes. But I think the most important perspective that I've seen so far in some of your writing and also in some of your tweets and other podcasts is that you you come from a renewable standpoint where a lot of these Bitcoin miners are coming maybe from like a, a Bitcoin standpoint or maybe from like an oil and gas standpoint or just like a pure energy like infrastructure side. And you're coming from the renewable side, uh, which... Maybe we can let's dig into what that means first for the firm you're at and, and what you do there. But uh, it, it's definitely like a different perspective than a lot of other Bitcoiners have. And uh, I appreciate just the sometimes the rebuttals, but also just the clarity that there's there's more going on in this conversation than a lot of the Bitcoiners are just putting out on the surface. But what do you do exactly at, at RES still? So? Sure. So I, so I have to start obviously with a boilerplate that, you know, my, my opinions are not those of my employers past, you know, present, future, whatever, you know, these are my own opinions as a Bitcoiner. Um, and I'd also say that, you know, to your point of me, you know, saying the renewable side of things, I I usually do that more as like a steel man. Like I, I see an argument that I think clearly misrepresents what's actually going on. And I feel the need to, to rebut that. You know, I'm I am in no way like a renewable maximalist or, or th- things of that nature. Which you know, there are people. You know, I I straddle Bitcoin Twitter and energy Twitter, which is actually kind of like climate Twitter. You know, like all of these people that are net zero carbon. You know, and I'm certainly not like I'm not of that nature. You know, but I I do try to disabuse you know ideas whenever I see them. Um, but yeah, so I work for a renewable developer. Yeah, you know, after I say all that, you know, I work for a renewable developer, um, and basically my role there is to analyze the grid. So I, you know, I do analysis of the grid, identifying certain locations, what's going on, you know, where is there congestion, things like that. And then I also do kind of strategy of like, okay, what should we do to develop more projects? That's like, you know, without getting into the nitty gritty, that can be kind of understand understood as what I do on a day to day. And like just a little bit more background, I came I came to this company after a short stint at Oak Ridge National Lab doing power system modeling. It's kind of like a niche area. And then before that I actually worked at ERCOT also doing modeling. So just kind of went from building models, researching models, and now like actually implementing models. And most of the jobs in this industry now are for renewable developers. There's basically been like a gold rush, if you will, of renewable development recently. And so that's where a lot of people with my skill set kind of end up. No, it's great to get your perspective on these things because just like you laid out there, like you've been in almost every single part of the energy infrastructure or modeling side, it seems. And that is like the core thing that people are batting back and forth on Twitter is like, what does a Bitcoin mining energy grid look like? What is the model for that? What are the assumptions we're making? Are those assumptions correct? Uh, Where could we be wrong? What needs some tweaking? And for, for right now, just to like lay the conversation out there, we have basically two models, which is the decentralized hash hut somewhere or your like little container somewhere next to an energy source, whether that be stranded energy, maybe some sort of solar setup or a hydro setup, like stranded energy in a small containerized unit, 
or we have these huge mega mines at interconnects that are taking up a large sinks of energy. So like think of your riot blockchains in Rockdale where they're soaking up, you know, 400 plus megawatts of energy. So we, we have the two systems that are they're clashing back and forth, at least on Twitter. In reality, there's you know, there's these smaller guys out there who are using like retrofitted spots here and there, taking between you know, 20 and 100 megawatts. That's probably actually more common than either one or the other. But that's not the conversation. The conversation on Twitter is this decentralized model versus the mega mine model. And we had Steve Barber on a few weeks ago talking about the folly of the mega mines. He had a nice Substack piece about it. I came on the podcast, gave his opinion. It definitely stirred up some controversy. I got a lot of messages asking about what he was talking about. So I wanted to bring you on to get some of your thoughts on his model, what you thought about it, what you saw was right with it, what you would critique with it, and how Bitcoiners can think about uh, grid modeling going forward. So I think we could just start right there. How do you think about uh, his decentralized model where we're bringing containerized units to the energy source? Is that a reliable way of building a Bitcoin mining infrastructure? Does it work with the grid or is there problems there? Absolutely. Like just to just to set the stage, I think I believe I, I agree with 90% of of what Steve wrote. You know, like I, I think it's smart, spot on, especially for someone that doesn't work in power systems. His intuitions are great. Like, you know, sourcing, you know, the transmission losses piece, not to get into specifics, but the transmission losses piece is a little iffy for me because losses are kind of like, you know, they're just kind of accepted if you're talking about renewables and you, you need to go where it's sunny and go where it's windy and that's far away. Um, but Steve's pretty spot on in terms of intuition. Now, the, the fact of the decentralized, decentralization versus centralization like Bitcoin mining is just too lucrative. Like it's 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 gonna have to mature, and it's too lucrative of a resource to not end up on the grid being used in some sort of fashion. There's no way to stop it. Like I think I think generally the decentralized model is going to continue to work. There's still going to be off grid, you know, natural gas wells. There's still going to be home mining. And I think the no KYC coins are going to have a premium that's going to make that type of mining a little more lucrative. But I think we're going to end up in just like a situation where the mining on the grid is going to get more regulated, more centralized kind of fashion. And that's that's going to benefit from you know, you know the benefits of the scale. And then you're also going to have the no KYC version. I think they're going to coexist uh, for sure. Now, what did you ask something about Steve's specific point? Oh, that was the the mining on site, right? Yeah, the containerized model where basically I, I move a, a container full of ASICs to the site of energy and basically soak up that energy at the location. And he had yeah. a few justifications for that, whether that be like loss of transmission, uh, loss of energy over transmission yeah. line. Or uh, there's a few reasons. The but bigger, the bigger variable there is, and I and I just wrote an article about this. There's a good section about it, which is you know firming up revenue for the generator. You know, a lot of a lot of producers of energy, be that oil, which I'm not super familiar with, or you know wholesale power, they're they're at the mercy of whatever their wholesale market can provide, whatever their off taker can provide. If you're a wholesale solar or wind farm. You're purely at the mercy of grid pricing when it comes to your off taker and whatever kind of PPA you can secure. With Bitcoin, now all of a sudden there's an alternative. Like now, now someone can bring the power to you and you know, you can go behind the meter, which the meter is the actual, like that's how you actually play in the market, right? Is like, you know, you could be like 10 miles along a Gentai and your meter is all the way over here. So you're producing a hundred megawatts. All that power flows on your Gentai and you actually get to sell 97 megawatts to the grid. Well, now you can put a Bitcoin mine behind your meter and you know have like a bus bar PPA effectively and have like a secondary offtaker. Or you could put just an empty warehouse and sell the rack space. I mean, the flexibility is huge for a power producer. And that's what I'm saying, which is that it, like it's too lucrative to not happen uh, in that kind of model. So the model makes sense. Um the, the the contrast here, of course, was like the mega mines. I mean, it's tough. the The problem is the power. You have to deal with the power producers if you go behind their meter, and sometimes they want to play, and sometimes they don't. I think it makes more sense for them to play with you and give give you room on their bus bar if they're suffering 
curtailment or if they're suffering from poor pricing. Like if you're if you're a generator and all of a sudden you're missing out on revenue that you thought you would have, well, you've got to make that up. And a Bitcoin mine makes sense to do that. Whereas these mega mines, this is just part of their business model. Let's connect to the transmission grid. Let's take the wholesale pricing here, or let's take the load zone rate, but let's hedge with the PPA, which gets kind of hairy. But you know, when you connect on the transmission side, now all of a sudden you can act as a grid resource, which I think is is the piece that Steve is kind of missing, if you will. And that I think that was the big the the one part that I messaged you on Twitter about after listening to that podcast is his model of the distributed demand response about how you know you don't have to be a miner of size to do demand response. That's not really correct. Like if if you're a resource on the grid, the grid operator can use you to do things. Like they can use you to solve constraints, which is, you know, it's a hairy term. I can talk about it, but like if there's an overload on the transmission system, the grid operator can use you to free that up. If you are a distributed network of miners, it's not that easy. Like it's, is it doable in theory? I guess, but is it is it doable in practice? Not right now. Like the, you know, the transmission level system stops at substations, and then there's a distribution level network, which is like a crazy, you know, it's like a crazy string of wood pole distribution system that then eventually drops down to houses. And it's like, how do all of those miners coordinate to do stuff? It's it's kind of like a fuzzy hammer, you know, like you can you can lower the load generally but you can't do the types of things that you can do on the transmission network so that was like my main thing is that like you know that's not really possible nowadays yeah no let's walk this out for the audience because i think it is it's pulling on multiple multiple different disciplines uh and and so it can get a little hairy pretty quickly um i'm gonna boot it over to you but just to set the stage when we're talking about load uh demand load response in texas we're talking about the grid needs energy for whatever reason. Say it's a really hot, sunny day. Everyone's flipping their ACs on. And all these retail buyers or maybe even like larger players are trying to purchase energy from the grid. Uh, they need to pull that energy from somewhere. And often case, you can pull it from some of these industrial players who can flip off the switch. Uh, Bitcoin miners are really good at this. Uh, but so, so that's like the basic model, right? But how does that change when you have a decentralized model like Steve laid out versus a centralized model like we have like with these riot players and the larger mines. Okay. So generally power systems so generally power systems are made or are, you know, try to be operated to handle whatever the expected load is. Right. There's a lot of statistics that go into this. It's really like forecasting and there's a lot of like X sigma events, right? Like whenever ERCOT has a 72 gigawatt peak right? Like that's higher than they've ever had, you know, like these events where there's a lot of load. So you need to make sure that you can handle that demand with the amount of generation assets that you have online. Well, what if part of that 72 gigawatts of demand doesn't actually need to be on? What if they would rather be off, right? And so the point, and this is like a whole domain of power systems is, is it's like, you know, demand response, peak shaving, like ways that you can change the shape of that demand such that you don't need as much generation. So what's what's happened is whenever you put a load on a transmission system, that load can then participate in this wholesale market like a generator. Like a, like a generator can meet the demand, the load on the wholesale market can drop. You can kind of do this on the distribution system, but it's not as... It's not as one-to-one. It's not as clean. It's not as easy. It's not as transparent. Like this is what smart meters do. Like when people say, oh, let's put the smart meters on our houses. And then maybe we give the grid operator control of our meter during hot, sunny days. And then we get a pro rate. So let's say, you know, you're a residential customer in Texas. You pay nine cents a kilowatt hour. Well, ERCOT says, hey, we'll give you a smart meter. And if you let us control your thermostat, we'll give you you know, one and a half cents off all the time, right? So really your all in cost is now cheaper, but on a hot day, your thermostat might be like 82 degrees and you didn't set it like that. But because, because you have now given the grid this option of using you as a resource, 
you know, they have now given themselves some firepower to lower that demand. Right. And so this is the thing, a big mega mine, <laughs> mega mine like, you know, like the riot places, they are, they are now a grid resource that the grid can say, okay, we want you to shut off. You're not actually part of the scarcity demand. You're just like a base demand. Uh, you know, there's, there's like further more mature conversations that we can get to about like, well, if they're adding load to the system, doesn't that raise prices for everyone? But, you know, generally what that means is that they're not there whenever it's like the riskiest time, whenever the peak is there. Um, so, and it's easier to dispatch them if they're in one central place, <laughs> you know, than if it's, you know, 10,000 different people all with five kilowatts of hardware, you know, the coordination problem of ordering them all to, to ramp down and then like, does that reduction in demand actually flow to where it's needed, you know, or does like, there's not really, to be completely honest, there isn't really that much awareness of distribution topology. Like, oh, from this substation, these lines go here, these lines go there. Like, there isn't really situational awareness of what lines are in service and what lines aren't. Like, that level of granularity isn't even there. So saying that we could turn off a megawatt worth of Bitcoin miners in neighborhoods and have the same impact as a megawatt miner that's on the grid is just not true. And that's, I'm not saying it shouldn't be true. I'm just saying that it's not like not nowadays. It's the same with rooftop solar. You know, there's like a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do we combine rooftop solar in a meaningful way to play in the network? It seems like it's a, co it's a coordination game, which is really important for these open energy markets that they're trying to create or, or God is like obviously a great example of it, or at least like the example that's in most every headline when we're talking about free energy markets and you do have a lot of problems with that coordination and you need that coordination to produce a price for people to buy energy off the grid at. So you said geography slash topography, like where is this excess energy located? And is there someone using it at a moment's notice, uh, contacting them and getting like the system set up in place, like some sort of, I don't know, computer protocol or whatever to, to get the energy turned off. I mean, I've even heard it's down to like the ASICs, like there's not firmware or back doors for some of these ASICs that you're able to control them in a way that would be able to turn them off and give that energy back to it to the grid. Like there's not that specificity of uh, remote control software yet. Like it's being built, but I've I've heard that that has even been it has been an issue. There's a distinction here that's important, which is that you can also just turn the ASIC off. I mean, turning turning the ASIC off and fully reducing your load is incredibly useful. For, for a grid, you know, if a, if the grid needs megawatts, it's willing to pay you to turn off, and that will happen. Now, the distinction there is that that's that's just a load resource that's willing to drop. If you want to use the firmware to actually control the output of the ASIC, that's a whole nother order of magnitude of complexity, right? Like, and in that regard, only the transmission level grid resource, I think, makes sense to do that with. Because, you know, like, let's say you have a 100 megawatt mine that you could overclock your machines to 115, or you could maybe ramp them down to like 20%. You know, that kind of controllable load resource on the grid is pretty much effectively what, you know, thermal generators do now. Like, you can play in the market very, very you know, well, now, would you want to do that with new generation ASICs? <laughs> Probably not. But it depends on how much ERCOT is willing to pay you to do it, right? Like if, if you are, if you're paying three cents a kilowatt hour to run your machines and ERCOT is willing to give you a 25, yeah, a 2.5 cent credit. So allowing them to do that would get your all-in cost to like less than a cent then maybe you do, you know, maybe that math does work out. Um, but you won't be able to control your ASIC in your house with enough granularity to, to have changes on the higher level transmission network. Like it's basically lost in the losses at that point. So there's a, two distinctions there. Like you can just drop your load and you can control your load. Controlling your load is, you know, it's called controllable load resource in ERCOT. And that was like another thing that I was going to bring up with um, Steve's point, which is that you know, controlling your Bitcoin miners output 
with grid signals is kind of like a point of contention in ERCOT with intellectual property because Lan- Lancium has effectively patented the concept of doing this. And that's why in their in the articles from Bitcoin Magazine when Lancium says, oh, we, we own and operate all of the CLRs in ERCOT. And I'm like, yeah, because you've patented it. <laughs> so, so, you know, that was going to be another thing that I wanted to bring up on, on Steve's point is that once you start talking about using grid pricing to dispatch your miners, then you're going to run into this kind of situation where there's a little bit of people in the market have done some intellectual property and some moating around this concept that is going to have to get worked through before, you know, you can fully believe in, you know, that you'll be litigation free and doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. What I'm getting out of the conversation so far is like, there's, there's uh, aspirations and then there's reality. And those two things are not matching up very cleanly for a lot of these arguments, uh, which I think is why you mostly see retrofitted mines that have between like 20 and 150 megawatts in most locations because this small decentralized model is an aspiration that hits up with a lot of problems and then the mega mines take a lot of capital so uh when those two things collide you get a different product it's also just a different business model i mean like i said in this article that i put out these mines that are connected on the transmission level like they are going to have rules like they are going to, they are, there are going to be additional rules for them because, and it's not necessarily like the grid is trying to be, you know, draconian. It's not that ERCOT has a problem with Bitcoin as a money. It's that there are real risks whenever you have a hundred megawatt load that can drop in an instant. Like that's, that's a risk, you know, ERCOT has to be able to fix frequency when you do that. When you drop a hundred megawatts, frequency is going to skyrocket. And ERCOT only knows how much resources they need if you tell them that that's going to happen. So there's going to be all these new rules for Bitcoin miners interconnecting. Like they're going to have to prove redundancy. They're going to have to prove that, you know, an AT&T worker can't like drop their load randomly, you know. So it's a different business model if you want to not worry about all that stuff. You know, like for for generators, if you want to come onto the grid, it's like a three-year wait time as a critical path. And like one year of that is EPC. So if you're a Bitcoin miner and you want to get stood up now, like you're probably not going to want to go through the grid route, or at least not after these new rules come in. So there's a lot of variables at play and this industry is like 10 years old. So, you know, all these things are still, they're still shaking out on what the inevitable model will be. I think going back to what I said originally, I think in like 20 or 30 years, you're going to have, you know, the suit model with people on the grid that do the interconnection that run that. And then you're also going to have the off grid model with the KYC being a premium, the no KYC being like a strong aspect of that people probably mining at a loss electrically, but able to make that up with the premium on the, on the non KYC coins. Yeah. Just to follow up on this, uh, Texas is obviously exploding with every day. I hear about like another hundred to 500 megawatt mine being deployed. Uh, Bitcoin conference last week, like everyone was on stage talking about their new deployment in, in West Texas. To me, like that's great to an extent, but I think there's a lot of dollars chasing like few assets. And like what you're saying right now is ERCOT has a process. It's been around for a while. And as much as it's like a free energy market, it's also a bureaucracy at some point. So how are they going to look at this? And how are they going to look at this uh, this stranded energy story that all these Bitcoin miners are talking about? Like, is this like all pipe dream or people need to like tamper the brakes and, and have a little perspective here about what's going to take? Yeah, it's interesting. I also get messages from my old ERCOT colleagues about just the gigawatts that are coming online. And, you know, it's it's a similar story to whenever people talk about the interconnection queues for renewables. You know, it's like, oh, there's 50 gigawatts of solar coming online. It's like hard to believe. And it's the same with the Bitcoin mining numbers when I hear is that it's it's hard to believe. And right now, to be honest, ERCOT doesn't really know how to handle these things. I think I think if the amount of gigawatts of Bitcoin mining come onto the ERCOT grid that are supposed to, it's a serious problem. Like you, you can't add, you know, six, eight gigawatts of constant demand in a place where there hasn't been in a span of a year. Like the grid is just not worked to be planned that 
in that pace. You know, it's not meant to be studied in that pace. I mean, these things are like slow tortoises and how they're planned and how they're operated and things like that, which is, which is why I think the, the interconnection process, which is what, which is what it's called, the interconnection process from the time that you apply all the way through the studying, through the, you know, the securitization, through the transmission system operator, like negotiations, contracts, all the way to actually coming online, that process is probably going to, it's just going to be elongated, right? It's going to look more and more like a formal interconnection process where they study you, they prove that you don't do any harm, and then they finally let you come in. Because that's the big thing about these, these grids. And a lot of things is like, a lot of people that I see on Twitter talk about it like it's a nefar- like it's an inherently nefarious thing. Like the grids don't want you there. It's going to lead to, you know, some sort of draconian thing. And it's like, not exactly. Like these these grids have to be operated a certain way. Like they have to. Like if if they're not operated like this, it's a risk. It's a life or death risk. And so you have to first prove no harm in what you're doing, and then it moves forward. So I. I think all these miners are in for a rude awakening when it comes to the interconnection process or even curtailment. I think it's possible that a lot of these loads out in West Texas end up getting curtailed where they can't they can't operate because of some sort of grid constraint. You know, there's a a good example of this. I know I'm kind of rambling, but a good example of this is um, ERCOT built something called the CREZ. I can't remember what it is, but it's C-R-E-Z, something about renewable zones. And they built a huge 345 kV transmission loop all the way out through West Texas. And the point was to incentivize wind to come out here, right? The, The wind had just gotten the $26 per megawatt hour production tax credit, right? And they were like, oh, we need wind. So ERCOT preemptively built this transmission loop all these wind generators went out there. This is years ago. This is this is why there's negative pricing now. And and they all went out there gigawatts. Like you'll see Sean Connell from Lanceum's tweets about how many gigawatts there is. And then a couple of years ago, a buddy of mine actually at ERCOT was doing this study and realized that there's instability out there. So like stability is one of the things in power systems where it's like there's so much wind out here, and there's like one transmission path to get back, like one loop. And so because of this instability, they've now constrained the whole west of Texas, right? So now there's like 40 gigawatts of stranded wind that they didn't model. They didn't expect to be constrained in this way. But you can't operate a power system in conditions like that. So that's why all this negative pricing is going on. And whenever you do these huge things, like these like, you know, I wouldn't call it a black swan, but it's like you do a lot of change really quickly, things like this are going to happen. I think these Bitcoin miners, there's going to be some that are at risk of something like that happening where, you know, you put all this CapEx in your Bitcoin mine, all of a sudden you're curtailed 20% of the time. What happens? You know, now you've got counterpart, like now you're hosting miners, you owe them money, like they've got machines, these machines are depreciating, you know, and I, I think that's a serious risk at happening whenever you put all this load in one place. Just to summarize, it seems like the, the old story with the wind was there is a huge influx of supply of energy production. And now we have a huge influx of demand for energy and those two things aren't necessarily going to work together as cleanly they, as a lot of people are predicting. They might. It, it. They might. You know, I'm. I'm a little optimistic, but I. But I. You know, I wouldn't say that it's you know dead on arrival or anything like that. But I'm saying that there are uh, you know unintended consequences of putting tons of load or tons of generation in one place. And and the thing is, all that wind over there is supposed to bring zero dollar marginal cost electricity eastward. You know, so all that wind is supposed to be coming in and, and, and making prices for central Texans cheaper. That's what the wind is supposed to be doing. But if you put Bitcoin miners out there, now all the Bitcoin miners are getting the cheap electricity, right? So that's, that's going to be the next layer of conversation now is not only, or like maybe, maybe we've satisfied the Bitcoin is a demand on the grid you know, argument. Like, oh, they turn off during scarcity events. You know, it's not a problem. The next level argument is, well, they're taking my cheap electricity. You know, even if your S9 has a break even price of 40 bucks, that's a price that I don't get. You know, so there's going to have to, that's going to be the next conversation that we're going to have to tackle around like how much is, you know, the Bitcoin mining worth societally. 
Yeah, no, it's fascinating because I, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that secondary part yet, but it does make sense if you're if you're introducing new buyers, then the market's going to change. Every every article I read from Nick Carter now, I have to I have to like tear my hair out a little bit because it's like they're soaking like Bitcoin miners soak up all the negative electricity. And I'm like, yeah, versus the people in that area that could be soaking it up themselves. <laughs> you know, I mean, the the good thing is, is that they're raising prices for the generators like the generators are there. The, ge- the generators could be going out of business, but they're not. You're paying the generators to stay in business. That's that's the feel good story. The other story is it's kind of a zero sum game. You're raising you're raising electricity prices for other people. You know, it, it's a you know there's a buyer on one end and a seller on the other. So yeah, like the market's going to get its its cut of meat there. Like no matter what, uh, fascinating to get that that angle. Uh, personally, I think Texas. It might be a little overbought, just like looking at supply chain stuff. Like think of all the components that go into building a mine. Like you might source energy, but you need the miners there. You need the facility. You need transformers. You need to talk with ERCOT. Like there's a lot of layers to this. And uh, I, I just talked to all these people who are building out there. And at some point, and I guess they're under they like, contract too. They've posted security. Yeah. Like they're in it. <laughs> like they're they're real. And like that's that's another part of the ERCOT stuff is. It, they're real numbers. Like they, they have money on the table, and and so it's, you know, it's certainly it's certainly interesting. And I and I wanted to add to the second part about you know tearing my hair out on Nick Carter's thing is that r- right now we're in like a transient. This is how I describe it to people I know. Is like we're in a transient system of hash price. Like I think, I think the margins on Bitcoin mining are going to get way thinner. Like so thin mm-hmm. to where new model machines are only going to be profitable when run at you know single digit cents per kilowatt hour like right now you know it's hard to see that because it's so profitable right now and the machines are so expensive that you're like you're breaking neck to pay them back but i you know we're in like i said year what 10 11 of like dedicated bitcoin mining i think in a couple of decades the only people who are going to be able to run these machines profitably are those with extremely low input cost and that's going to really change the conversation because having a s an s9 that breaks even at 90 dollars a megawatt hour is a different conversation than one that breaks even at 10 bucks a megawatt hour or 11 because then then the consumers are less worried yeah, my last thought on this part of the conversation before we can move over to renewables uh, is that miners have their own economics and the grid has its economics. And putting those two things together isn't as clean as a, a blog post about Bitcoin mining in West Texas might make it look. Uh, there's a lot of inputs for energy grids and there's a lot of inputs for Bitcoin mining. And at the end of the day, you would need to be in the green for Bitcoin mining. Otherwise, might as well just turn off your machine and wait till conditions improve. Uh, it could really be some some burnout on that front. Uh, but, you know, I'm optimistic. More hash rate online is a good thing as long as it's like not too geographically condensed, in my opinion. Agreed. Yeah, and I will... One, one last sentence on that is that I thought... It, I thought um, Steve's point on, you know, the honeypot, his, his section on the honeypot, I thought that was very prescient. I thought that was a very good point. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. Renewables. Okay, so we only have about 15 minutes left, uh, but it's rare that you get a Bitcoin miner who's into renewables or at least works for a renewable company. So we are uh, thankful and appreciative for it. And I think our listeners are as well uh, because it doesn't happen too often. There's been a lot of angst against renewables lately. Uh, last week, Blockstream, Block... And Tesla announced a 30 petahash project in Texas, I believe, uh, to use 100% solar to to mine Bitcoin. They're using like Tesla's power pack, so then you don't you can get around that constraint of only having the sun shining for eight hours a day. Uh, there was some pushback online on Twitter, to say the least, from the Bitcoin crowd saying like, "Why are you guys using renewables like this? Uh, renewables." use a lot of coal in the front end of the production and able to get in order to get these solar panels online. Uh, Tesla power packs use a lot of um, heavy metals and things that take a lot of extraction from the earth. I want to get your take on this project, uh, the new project from Tesla, Blockstream and Block, and also get some thoughts about renewables in Bitcoin mining. 
Sure. This is this is a loaded a loaded topic. So uh, again, my views aren't that of my employer. Um, you know, so the I I describe the ESG as kind of a Mott and Bailey, like the the strong argument for ESG if you were to steel man it would be that you know certain emissions cause issues for humanity as a whole and sometimes those emissions don't have an associated cost that's borne by the producer so how how do we coordinate to solve that problem like that's that's a strong argument that i think everyone would have to accept that you know if emissions are a problem there has to be some sort of effort to to prove that if there's a market failure in that, right? Like if it's, if it's cheaper to dump, you know, your output in a stream, then we have to have some sort of corrective mechanism for that, be it derived from property rights. You know, you're, you're hurting the property rights of people globally. So there has to be some fix for that or, you know, some mechanism for that. That's the steel man. And I can kind of get behind that, right? Like I understand th- that, argument and i also kind of intuitively think that over the past 100 years if we've been sending gases into the atmosphere it's hard to imagine that that doesn't have an impact right like just intuitively if you do a lot of stuff there's going to be an impact like on the other side of things whenever i see climate scientists that have you know this very specific tuned model you know, where they, they defined all the inputs in this way, they defined other inputs in this way, and they ran their sensitivities and they say, you know, global warming is up by 1.6 degrees. You know, the, the engineer in me is like, I, I don't know what to make of that. You know, like, I don't see how you could define your variables so precisely that it, that it gives you an outcome that just so happens to align with like the activist, you know, the activist body that also includes, includes like government legislation that includes subsidies you know there's like a lot of misaligned incentives there so so for me squaring the two things squaring that you know outsized gases in the atmosphere probably has an impact on the earth and that you know a coordination problem to solve that would be difficult and you know there's a lot of modeling that's going into this that is really sophisticated like a Rube Goldberg machine that seems to like end up with more government regulation you know like the libertarian in me has a problem with that um but the libertarian in me also likes to solve interesting problems and i work for a company that does an interesting thing which is like we've we've got a product that produces energy passively based on the sun. And my job is to see where we can put that. And so it's kind of an interesting engineering problem to solve. Um, and there's no fuel cost. Like that's the coolest part to me is that once you're done, once you've built it, you're pretty much through. Like that's that's pretty much it besides some variable maintenance. Like the sun comes down, it produces energy for the life of the project. Um, so that's that's the interesting thing. And that ties into the Blockstream project as well. I think it's interesting because it proves it proves that you can do it with renewables. It's it's kind of a PR grab to be honest, um, but you know that's that's it. I think the interesting thing will be with their dashboard, we will be able to really calculate the levelized cost of solar and storage. That'll be the interesting thing, is that there's there's a lot of different numbers coming out about like over the life of this project, how much does it need to get per kilowatt hour to break even. A lot of numbers, you know, put like solar and wind down there with the most efficient natural gas, you know, coal a little bit higher, things like that. But it'll be interesting with Blockstream's numbers to see like, okay, how much did this actually cost for them to do this at this scale? Now, granted, it's a really small scale. I think it's a three megawatt solar facility, a 12 megawatt hour battery, and like a one and a half megawatt Bitcoin mine. So we're talking scales that like you know they don't benefit from economies of scale let's just say that so it's not going to it's not going to surprise me if it's really expensive um but doing it off grid will be interesting walk us through levelized cost of solar and storage like what does that mean um uh, i think that would be helpful for the audience to understand these these terms let's say you build a 100 megawatt solar farm right and 100 megawatt solar farm the the energy yield of the farm right like what it actually produces goes from zero at night and it comes up and it just tracks the sun through the day, right? Now, it produces that profile of energy based on the weather for the life of the project. Could be, you know, 30 years, could be 20 years, whatever. But there's a modeled amount of energy that it's going to create. 
you know, hundreds of gigawatt hours. And the idea is, however much the solar farm cost you in millions of dollars, divided by the amount of energy that it produced, gets you a dollar figure for how much that energy cost. And, and that is like a metric that's in the industry now for basically saying how much energy it costs. Right? Like that's, that's the price of the technology is the levelized cost of energy. For, for thermals that require fuel, it's like the capital that's involved in building it plus the fuel cost, right? Like you have to, you have to pay to build a facility and then there's fuel costs associated. So at the end of the day, how, how much does that megawatt hour you know, cost? Um, there's a little bit of uh, you know, debate now over whether or not dispatchability should be included in this. Right, like solar can cost solar can be cheaper, but if it's not there when you need it or when you want it to be there, does it really matter what it costs? You know, so there's there's talk of adding some sort of reliability metric or something like that to the figure, but you know that's that's how it stands now is the levelized cost of electricity or energy. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's really helpful to understand those terms. Um, last question for you on on this topic. Coal panels. It's like coal panels. the tweet has been going around so much lately. <laughs> Got to get your opinion on them. Yeah. It's, what do you it, think about, about, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. So, so I mean, you know, it, I'll, I'll steel man it. I'll steel man it. So the, I don't think Steve is ever going to be able to have a, a conversation unless he finds a price of CO2. So, so for Steve, for Steve to get an honest, an honest argument over what the cost is of this, then he's going to have to admit that CO2 has, has a cost. If it doesn't, then nothing is ever going to satisfy his need. All, all of the oil and gas off-grid people pretty much tell, tell everyone what the renewable arguments are, and, and then they answer them. Like So, so the, the coal panel argument is that when solar says it's green and net zero carbon, right? So they say that, and then there's usually a quote to eat that says, you know, like coal panels. And it's like, but yeah, that's a straw, man. Like the, the steel man of the argument is that, you know, the solar panel offsets the amount of coal that goes into it in like year one or two, you know? So like, mm-hmm. if you value the fact that there's no carbon being emitted, then that's a net good, right? Like, yeah, it took coal, but if you've avoided coal, after two years of a 20 year panel, then you're netting out to positive. Like, obviously, there's like a carbon accounting thing here, which, you know, it really depends on your geography and you can get really hairy in here. But it's, it's the idea of pricing carbon. If you, if you price carbon and you have a price, then you can work and say, okay, we need to avoid this. So, what ways can we do that? Um, I obviously have, you know, some sort of issues with those kinds of things. Obviously, you know, forced labor is terrible and like lithium mining is awful, you know, things like that. And I'm not about to get into an accounting war of like how many tons of earth is moved for lithium versus, you know, a coal facility and like the price of coal and the emissions. Like you can just talk about this for hours, you know? I am, mm-hmm. So I don't know if I answered No, I appreciate that perspective. <laughs> no, that did, that did answer it. I think it's, uh, I would love to see a battle royale, like I said, earlier between renewables on one side and the coal panel crowd on the other because they do just they they throw mud at each other back and forth on twitter every day and uh there's a lot of characterizing or mm-hmm. uh, characterizing i should say other per, other people's arguments without listening to them yeah my my favorite my favorite is the word renewable when people are like what does renewable mean and i just sit there and i tear my hair out and i'm like renewable means the fuel the fuel source renews over the span of a life. Like like that that word is kind of an anachronism to back whenever people thought we were going to run out of oil, right? People were like, we're going to run out of this fuel. Like, you know, that was the original kind of push. Like, we're going to run out. We need renewable stuff. You know, but now it's like, what do they mean renewable? They use coal. And it's like, oh man, can't even get started here. <laughs> can't even get started. But like to, to harken back to it, uh, what I said in the beginning, like the question of is carbon into the atmosphere bad, right? Like that's where you have to start. Do you believe that that's bad or do you believe that that's good? Like for sake of argument, just accept like a thought experiment, right? Accept that 
carbon in the atmosphere is bad. What mm-hmm. should we do about that? Like, w- what steps should we take? Like, what what kind of coordination can we as a society do to help that? You know, like, and and then kind of work from there. Like, if you don't accept that carbon is, is bad in the atmosphere, like that's an interesting proposition. Um, you know, but like, you're not going to have the same conversation with people that do think that. You know, mm-hmm. all all caveats mm-hmm. of libertarianism, and you know. Anytime the wor- someone tells you that the world's going to end, it's usually not a good sign. You know, all, all caveats of that aside. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Bitcoin Twitter is more than not so a, a place for marketing. So <laughs> yeah, that's everything right. people yeah. are saying for, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I've had to pull my punches <laughs> a lot of times. You know, you know, I, you know I, I see a tweet and I just want to pull my hair out. And again, like in my line of work, I'm usually the person that's, you know, steel manning the opposite. You know, I'm, I'm making the yeah. arguments the opposite, but then on Twitter, it's like all of a sudden I'm here defending renewables and, you know, I, I write this good tweet, you know, and I'm like, Oh man, I really expressed myself. Well, I think it's good. And I like never get a reply. You know, it's just like, it's not, you know, I just have, to, I've had to pull my punches and like not even engage anymore. Just like, ah, whatever. Like, uh, and there's a lot of talking your book too. You know, I mean, if, if you are obviously in an oil and gas industry, then you know, the arguments that you know best are the ones for oil and gas, you know, and if you're selling a product, like, I'm not saying there's an incentive there. Well, but, but there is, but that's just the arguments, you know, you know, so there's a little bit of that. Yeah, no, there's definitely a lot of bit of that. But let's <laughs> leave the conversation there. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on and talking about the grids in Texas. That was a different perspective than I heard from a lot of people and also renewables. Uh, Great having you on and hopefully talk again with you soon. Yeah, always a pleasure. Thanks.